Hello, how are you? Sarah Harrison joined WikiLeaks about four years ago. She came from the Center for Investigative Journalism and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. For, from researching and coordinating the publication of hundreds of thousands of censored documents with media across the globe, to making that information accessible to the public on the internet, to fighting for her organization's ability to persevere in the face of extra legal sanctions and the largest criminal investigation ever conducted into a publisher and its sources, which continues today, to protecting not only her own organization's sources, but those of other journalists and publishers, the tireless and courageous work of WikiLeaks investigation editor, Sarah Harrison has enlightened and empowered public discourse in a manner few of her colleagues can credibly claim for themselves. Were it not for Harrison's work, our news would be dominated by stories about the imprisonment and prosecution of Edward Snowden by the US government. Were it not for her commitment to preserving our historical record, we would not know the facts surrounding the deaths of tens of thousands of civilians by US-led engagements in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, and Somalia, or understand the whole-scale privatization of intelligence. It's a pleasure to speak with Ms. Harrison today. Thank you. So on April 25th, the Department of Justice lawyers stated that the multi-subject criminal investigations into WikiLeaks and its sources continues. Uh, prior to that, Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald both made public entrances into the US. Uh, on the advice of your counsel, you've been advised not to return to the UK. Why can't you go home? Um, well, the UK has a unique um uh, part of its terrorism law, which is called Schedule 7. Um, Schedule 7 is about detaining people at ports, so airports, boat ports, um, any entrance or exit to the country. And what they can do there is they can um, detain anyone for questioning on no more than a hunch, as has just been proven in the recent Miranda judgment. Um, when you're there, you're what we would generally expect to be the rights of someone being questioned um, are taken away. You have no right to silence. You must answer their questions or you're committing a crime. Because of my involvement in two um, very significant cases um, for the US and UK governments, that being WikiLeaks and Snowden, um, my lawyers uh, feel certain or relatively certain that I would be detained under Schedule 7 at which point, for reasons of source protection, I would not answer the majority of their questions and therefore would be committing a crime upon entering my home country. You mentioned that Laura and Glenn had gone back to the US. Um, they had very specific circumstances within which they did this, though. They um, were going to collect a very um, uh, important and prestigious award, and they just went for a short period of time. Um, if I were to try to return home to live, I would not have those protections. And so on those basis, um, it's advised that I remain here in Germany. Why should Germany or any country grant Edward Snowden asylum? Well, it's a question, um, it's a moral and ethical, but also a uh, political question, this one, and of course a legal one. Um, the, the law around um, asylum is that someone, sh mo that most countries are signed up to, is that someone should uh, be given asylum if they um, uh, have committed, if they need it for their political opinion or if they face persecution if they go home. Um, Edward Snowden's act of disclosure was inherently a political act. Um, he did this because the US government was uh, breaking its own constitution and spying on its own citizens. Um, in addition, if he went back to the United States, I think it is quite clear he would be persecuted. If you look at the trial of Chelsea Manning, the uh, sentencing of Jeremy Hammond, this shows um, a record of persecution of these sorts of truth tellers by the United States government. So on these two bases alone, he legally deserves asylum in most countries in the world. 
I think also morally, morally and ethically for having shown how our rights are being eroded and we're being spied on by a foreign government, it would be the correct thing to do for other countries to give him asylum. So therefore, I think the more interesting question is why people aren't giving him asylum. And I think that that is due to the US dominance and people are too scared, governments are too scared, we've seen it in the statements coming out of the German government, to actually stand up for what is the right thing to do and for the values they purportedly believe in. Um, and so for this reason, unfortunately, countries are holding back and, and are not giving him the asylum he deserves. The US government claims that the programs are legal, albeit secret. And Snowden has said, quote, for me, in terms of personal satisfaction, the mission's already accomplished. I've already won. As soon as the journalists were able to do work, everything that I had been trying to do was validated. Because remember, I didn't want to change society. I wanted to give society a chance to determine if it should change itself. So for you, would it be acceptable in your opinion if the American public decided that they would tolerate being spied on by their own government? Um, so firstly, going back to some points that you made in, your, um, in the actual question, the government of course is, is trying to say that they haven't broken any laws, but I think the revelations have made it perfectly clear that they have by spying on their own citizens. Um, in addition, yes, Snowden's uh, predominant first aim was, was to start a debate and see what happened with that, although I think he's made it perfectly clear um, that his own personal view is that these, um, this surveillance is excessive. So the question on whether I would be happy if the US decide it's okay, I'm not a US citizen, so what the United States does is, um, is not necessarily how I feel my government should be behaving. These revelations have shown that um, other governments are colluding uh, with the United States. Um, the Five Eyes Alliance, Five Eyes Alliance which um, my own country, the United Kingdom, um, is uh, particularly uh, a large part of. Um, and so the question for me is, am I okay with what my government is doing or is allowing happening, allowing to be happening to me? Um, I think that, th I mean, this is obviously not okay for me. Our rights are being eroded. This is a very slippery slope. Um, and I wish that my government would stand up for my rights more. The larger question though is, I think, why do our rights matter at all? Um, our rights are in place to keep our personal autonomy, to allow us not to be dominated by an outside power. Um, with this erosion of rights that we see in um, these surveillance revelations, this is precisely what is happening. There is a large dominance that is um, uh, coming into force um, and growing all the time around uh, the world by the United States. This is a very large geopolitical issue, and you can see how the effects of this dominance um, in this geopolitical way with um, things like, I was just saying, um, how countries feel unable to give Snowden asylum, or um, you see the way they're able to yield this geopolitical pressure with regards to things like the um, uh, climate conference in 2009 in Copenhagen where uh, they were surveilling and um, surveilling the communications to find out how other countries were going to play to try and engineer um, that conference. Um, and I think I, when, when it came out, for example, that Merkel's phone was being spied on, of course, there was a little bit of initial outrage by her, but I do wonder, maybe she suddenly sat there and thought, gosh, what are the contents of my calls? Maybe actually I shouldn't start stomping my feet about this because you don't know what will come out. Um, and how that could be used. So, for me, this is a global issue, and for me, other nations around the world, and I wish, should be standing up against this dominance and against this US surveillance, and I wish my country would do that. So, governments obviously conduct foreign intelligence. Most governments do, that can afford it, etc. Uh, how is the nature of US foreign intelligence activities uh, pertaining to what Snowden disclosed significant or different? To everybody spying? I, it's, I mean, it's obvious. Uh, countries spy. They generally, as you say, all have intelligence agencies. Uh, it is the nature of countries to try and do this. What is different about the United States surveillance is um, its scale and its quality. So it's, 
it's conducted on a on a huge um, huge scale in um, a large variety of means. The ability to store this information, um, which is now at very low cost, is um, very pervasive. It means it's very pervasive. With the United States as well, their actual um, abilities are um, made very easy because of the huge budget which they have. The, the budget has doubled in the last 10 years. The number of people with national security clearance in the United States has doubled in just the last four years. There's now five million people with this clearance. That's the size of Norway. I mean, I think we'd all be very annoyed if every single person in Norway was running around collecting all our information. But it, we don't understand. <laughs> we don't understand the significance of it when it's the other side of the globe. When these facts and figures are, are they attempt to keep relatively hidden. So this this huge, pervasive, um, at great scale, mass surveillance makes it inherently different to any other nation's uh, spying capabilities. When something is that large, its quality changes in and of itself. Um, it would be like trying to say that the hydrogen bomb is just another bomb. It's obviously not. It becomes a geopolitical tool. And I think that this, this dominance in this, um, this way is what makes the NSA surveillance um, very different to any other countries and far more worrying. You know, something that uh, it's interesting, you know, following the coverage related to you specifically, uh, you know, it, it, you know, one of the questions I was wondering is, what's it like to be the WikiLeaks cleaning lady? Like, there <laughs> seems to be a complete... And I think part of that, it's my opinion, part of that has to do with the fact that you're female, to be quite honest. Uh, I mean, there's an element of it. Um, and also, you know, you came from the Center for Investigative Journalism and the Bureau for Investigative Journalism, and you've been with a, a new organization and, and, and the like. And I think a question that a lot of people uh, perhaps don't understand is why would WikiLeaks um, and your work at WikiLeaks, why would you protect another journalist's source? Um, for us, it was more of an issue of why wouldn't we do it? Um, we have a, uh, uh, one of our uh, core ethics is about source protection. Um, we've seen and lived what happens uh, in these situations. Julian has um, been in prison, has been detained. Of course, the whole organization watched the Manning trial very closely and saw the persecution that happened there, the fact that um, the US government, with its um, uh, intent mission on trying to create an example of what happens if you tell the world the truth, you get thrown in jail, you get thrown in a cage, um, tortured and then put in prison for 35 years. That's the example that they desperately wanted to set and unfortunately achieved it with Manning. We felt that it was very important that there was another example um, of what happens um, for journalist sources, for whistleblowers, if you do tell the truth. You can still have a voice. You can take part in the debate that you have begun. Um, it was very clear to us right from the beginning that there was no other organization that was willing or able to assist Snowden um, in a way that would fully protect him. And so it was, it was not really of a question to us or to me about would we help. It was, it was just about doing it. And what did WikiLeaks do? What was the... Um, a variety of things from uh, legal advice, specifically um, in the region, uh, Hong Kong, that he was in. Um, uh, then there was the matter of um, being able to get out safely from Hong Kong, um, which we assisted with. Um, we negotiated a number of informal asylum offers um, so that he would have uh, somewhere to go. And uh, then obviously staying with him to ensure he was protected on the journey and then what turned out to be a month in an airport, and, um, <laughs> uh, and then three months in Russia to ensure that um, he was protected, that he could keep his voice, um, and uh, that he was uh, able to continue uh, living as safe as possible. And, yep. and you were able to basically witness what was going on and to be a witness for the world, essentially. Yes, I mean, if anything had happened, um, I, he made a comment that I quite liked in uh, his European... Uh, Parliament statement about how um, he was with an organization, protected by an organization at that time that had the biggest microphone in the world. He's 
talking about our Twitter account. <laughs> and uh, that it's kryptonite for spies. And if anyone had tried to pressure him into doing something that he didn't want to do, then the world would have known there was a witness there, as you say. Do you think the publication strategy of the Snowden disclosures to date has been effective? Um, Given that, I mean, Snowden has talked about the fact that he wanted to, uh, he, he didn't want to change society, that he, he, he wanted to give society a chance to determine uh, if it could change itself. Uh, so do you think that that has been effective? Um, the first point to say is that I think that it's a huge success that anything has come out at all. Um, if he'd gone, history has shown if he'd gone somewhere directly like the New York Times, they would have just sat on it. Um, I think the Laura and Glenn have been extremely brave and done great work. Um, I think it's obvious with regards to the, the um, focus of the uh, publications that it's, it's very US focused. Um, so then when talking about the, the global strategy of this, um, the information has come out in, uh, outside of the US in uh, little sort of drips um, in, in places around the world um, that are seemingly at random. Um, a little bit in Italy one week and then next month a little bit in Norway. Um, I think that this has a couple of issues. From, an out, from a global perspective. Uh, one is that you end up with a process of normalization and habituation of the information to the, the global public. Um, it, it, it means that there's less outcry. Of course, uh, in some places here in Germany, for example, certainly within certain communities, there has been um, a decent outcry. Uh, but Germany is definitely one of the more successful uh, international areas uh, of this publication. Uh, Laura is based here and, and of course uh, Jake Applebaum has been working uh, very hard on these publications as a journalist and I think this has really um, has helped the impact here but it is not this case at all in most countries of the world um, people are too used to it yeah yeah we know we're being spied on now is unfortunately uh, for most people the, the reaction um, I also think that for creating a change a, within those countries, but also, I would say, within the U.S. itself. I th call me cynical, but I think the fact that the United States government is suddenly going to grow a conscience is not a hugely sane idea. Um, I would say that the best way for um, a real change to happen is for outside pressure to occur. And when there isn't a reg coordinated regional um, uh, strong publication in certain regions that allows these countries to um, get to a level of outcry and, and come together and, and come together as a region, strengthening each other, then they have more ability to actually stand up against the United States. Germany alone is, does not have that power, as we have seen with the, the issues with the inquiry that's sort of starting here. You know, at the height of uh, Chelsea's three-year trial, uh, you know, where she was convicted to, uh, for, on 20 offenses for 35 years. Um, you know, it was pretty much established uh, that she had no intent to harm the United States. And in fact, she did, uh, as determined by the United States government. Uh, damage is not actually the language that's used in the trial. It's, uh, it's impact, it's probable risk, and Manning was uh, convicted on a probable harm standard. Uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency did a comprehensive review of all the documents and, and um, William Arkin actually uh, tweeted out that he had found out that the assessment was low to moderate risk. Um, so, you know, neither the Afghan war logs or the Iraq war diary, sorry, the Iraq war logs and the Afghan war diary <laughs> um, <laughs> contain the name of human intelligence sources. Uh, they contain the names of people, but the head of the uh, Defense Intelligence Agency review had determined that uh, most of the people were actually already killed on the battlefield, uh, those names. And it, despite what might be commonly understood, I mean, WikiLeaks did approach the State Department with regards to Cablegate and offered to elect, uh, privately elect, if they wished, mm -hmm. um, names, message record numbers, and the legal advisor at the State Department, Harold Coe, his response, that letter, 
that said that uh, WikiLeaks was in continuing violation of the law was the basis for extra legal sanctions against WikiLeaks. Uh, at that critical time for Manning, Snowden told Bart Gelman, quote, I don't desire to enable the Bradley, now Chelsea, Manning argument that these documents were released recklessly and unreviewed. Uh, I, I just would like to say, because this is sort of a common misconception, yeah. Manning actually sanitized the documents before they were sent to WikiLeaks, just FYI. Um, you, you clearly wouldn't agree with the, the notion that publishing full and unredacted documents is a reckless ask, so what has WikiLeaks learned uh, from Manning's releases, from publishing those? I mean, you, and thank you for explaining that. I mean, you were, you were at the trial, and I think it's a very important point that people often miss, is that the US government, who, if anybody wanted to try and show that there was any harm actually from this information coming out, it was the US government at that trial, and they were unable to. Uh, the whole redaction question has come from and is completely and utterly US propaganda. We saw it when we started with the Warlog publication. They instantly come out with blood on their hands, blood on their hands, which is, to me, completely ludicrous that people would accept this. We were actually publishing how the United States government had the blood of over 100,000 people on its hands, and we, for telling the world about this, were suddenly the ones at fault. It's, it's obviously completely wrong. Um, but this is something that they always do. They've done it since the 50s. Any national security journalist can tell you about the propaganda attacks that they, that they have, on, have on them. Um, it, was a, it was a difficult battle for us uh, through that period of 2010 and going into 2011 to show that this was not actually correct. Um, that the concept that information in and of itself can cause harm is just not logical. I mean, words on a page and bits and bytes of data don't actually cause harm in and of themselves. Um, as you said, the, the United States government had to, had to admit in the end that there was no harm caused from it. So this was a large battle that we fought and made, I think, great strides in this. Um, to me, it's very sad that um, the concept of redacting is now being, um, because they're scared, of, they're scared of pressure, is now being lauded up by journalists as how this is responsible journalism. To me, actually taking away our history and denying us of the ability to, to understand fully and have full access to documents is actually more reckless. And we have seen countless examples in our publishing history of where things that the journalists that we worked with did not decide was necessarily a big story to be told, but actually when that document was published in full at the end, have now become the basis of le legal uh, cases around the world where people are finally able to get justice. There's, if I may just tell you one uh, good example of this, actually from a, uh, to do with a German citizen, uh, Kathleen Dal Masri, who um, had the same name as a suspected terrorist. Now, this is a story that came from uh, uh, cables, but it was not actually chosen by journalists. This actually just came out when we published the full archive uh, in full in 2011. So he has the same name as a terrorist, and when he's on holiday in Macedonia, he gets kidnapped by the CIA, secretly renditioned, taken to a torture camp in Syria, moved on to Afghanistan, where he's also tortured. Eventually, the CIA sort of worked out they'd got the wrong person. They still kept him for four months before dumping him back in the Balkans. And he tried for a long time to get, um, uh, to get any justice for what had happened to him. Um, and he was unable to until we did our publication and he found this cable about himself which had been deemed of no public interest to anybody before. He was then finally able to take a case, he used our cables and he, um, there was finally a judgment made which, which used the cables in the judgment. So I think this shows that just allowing a few people to, to decide what we should know without giving us a full archive is, is problematic for our whole history and for, for justice for individuals. I think... It, it seems to me too, I think with the complexity of, of uh, the, the global environment and the global media, uh, it's in my opinion too, with you know, full archives, you're also able to uh, 
exploit the subject matter experts uh, from around the globe to look at, uh, you know, it's my opinion that, that, like, people would say, well, in terms of the Manning trial, like, oh, well, you obviously have an opinion about this trial, so therefore you're not objective. There's nothing more objective than a, a document the, the or a transcript. Documents. And the full source documents as well. I think uh, if you get a one page of a PDF, what's if, what if there's a big but on the next page? I mean, I think you need, the, you need the full archive. You need to see pieces of information within a context. One star does not make a whole constellation. It, it changes the nature when you see it and you can build these relationships. I think also there, there's, there's a big lesson that we, we found um, with Cablegate where we actually um, said that the uh, media organizations, because uh, apparently, they would have um, uh, uh, maybe some particular expertise in an area they were writing on. Um, silly idea, I know. Um, <laughs> that, um, that they could suggest the redactions. And we actually went through and we compared these. And all the redactions were due to reasons of libel. Um, political reasons. Uh, they weren't, we, the media organizations agreed to redact an individual's name if they were at imminent harm, uh, imminent immediate danger of loss of life. Um, and in fact, they were redacting names of large companies or politicians that were, you know, doing criminal acts around the world. So just that the whole process of redaction is actually corrupting. And the reasons why people redact are not necessarily as they say. So uh, let's, let's, let's talk about uh, this issue of redactions. That what kind of considerations does WikiLeaks make in evaluating how the organization is going to handle documents that it receives? Um, as a general sort of principle, we have learned, we, we made a mistake actually with the Iraq war logs um, where we redacted too much. We'd been hit with this massive propaganda attack, and so we. Um, started after the Afghan war logs. So we started with the Iraq war logs to um, ensure that this couldn't happen again. And the actual process we went through was we essentially started off with everything was redacted and then we put it back out there. So dictionary words went back out, etc. What you then ended up with was a data set that was essentially completely unusable for the public. Um, so this was a... Um, then after having survived the, this propaganda battle, um, having had the court case uh, where even the government, in the Manning court case where the government could not uh, prove harm, we have now understood that actually the way to approach publication is you start from the assumption that everything should be out. The public deserve their historical archive and they should know everything. If one hypothetically does need to look at a redaction. It should be very specific. Um, it should be about immediate and imminent real danger to someone's loss of life. And it should only be on a timed, uh, for, a for a short period of time. Would WikiLeaks ever approach the government or redact documents again in the future? Uh, working with the government uh, is something else that um, we have found to be uh, corrupting. It was an interesting, um, Ewan McCaskill from The Guardian uh, did a talk just the other day um, where he sort of um, explained how they'd gone to the White House about the NSA revelations, who'd helped them understand these documents and had also um, uh, showed them that quite a number of these stories um, shouldn't come out. So you can see quite blatantly there that the government is restricting our access to this understanding by working, by media organizations working with them. Yes, we did go to the government, um, or we did interact with the government um, before Cablegate, but the actual uh, details of this are that the government made a, uh, the US government made a public um, uh, display of how if we were to publish this, it would cause harm. Now, what they were doing there was they were setting up a legal basis for intent so that afterwards they could say, well, you, you knew this would cause harm, therefore you intentionally did this and it starts a, it's the legal basis um, for a case. So, of course, to this we had to respond. So our lawyers contacted the government and said, as you mentioned, um, okay, if there's harm, where, where is it? What, what can we do about it? To which they didn't respond. So I think this is just another example of how 
it's not, even they did not really see a harm or certainly didn't care about any, any um, supposed harm and that this was just another propaganda at attack. So would you uh, see the organization ever doing that again, approaching the... If we needed to respond in the way that we had there, I don't see us sort of approaching uh, a government because it just um, opens yourself up to be lent on in, in how you publish. Let me ask you this question. I mean, to me, WikiLeaks is born of the inter internet. Um, you know, in a certain sense, it has a different, even full source documents, you know, vis-a-vis -vis sort of search uh, capabilities. Uh, even in publishing public information with the Manning trial, there is a, um, a nature to having an archive that is found in a particular way on the internet, and it's structured in a particular way. It's delivered to the quote-unquote audience or the user in a different way. Um, uh, and there's no question for me, at least, there is a sort of, to use sort of common terms, a sort of disruptive innovation of, of, of WikiLeaks. It, you know, it's, it's a publisher, it's a library, it's a lot of different things. Uh, in what ways do you believe that WikiLeaks is different from other publishers? Let's like kind of talk about traditional media and then newer media. Um, I think that someone has to um, be at the front of pushing the boundaries of press freedom. Someone has to have the, the guts essentially and be able to stand there and, and to take these hits. Um, and I think that we're pretty uniquely set up to do this in the way that we um, are able to... Um, uh, we've decentralized enough, we're able to... We have a robust enough structure that we're not beholden to a certain jurisdiction or pressure from a certain jurisdiction. Um, then, of course, there is our, um, uh, the fact that we will always publish uh, full source documents. Uh, the concept, um, uh, we use the term scientific journalism uh, in the same way that scientists will always publish the, the full uh, initial data that they've worked with to draw their conclusions and their analysis. We will always publish the full archive and the full document set. Um, then there are these additional sort of, um, I guess, added, uh, added elements that we believe very strongly in, in creating these searchable um, archives, ensuring that information is accessible but also usable for the public. Um, we do do our, uh, our own analysis, um, our own articles, but it is these additional um, elements um, that we provide, that we believe very strongly in, that I would say set us apart from other organizations. When you look at the way in which the Snowden releases have been, um, have done battle, so to speak, uh, to use that term, uh, with the NSA, how would you compare it to um, Manning's disclosures uh, against the Pentagon, where you publish these disclosures? Um, I mean, I, obviously, both battles are, are large. Um, taking on, in one way or another, the United States government is no mean feat. Um, with regards to the um, specific parts of the, the government um, that we, to use the word you just used, battled with, um, the Pentagon has had a large spin machine in place, a PR department in place, um, for a long period of time. It's... Um, it's huge, it has a lot of money thrown at it, there are people that are there putting out articles um, all the time. So to go up against this, and they, they knew we had Cablegate in advance, so they were already prepared. You had Clinton phoning up um, uh, ambassadors around the world saying, oh, this might come out, this might uh, be there, something that you need to deal with. So we already went into this publication with them having created a, a whole defense point against it. Um, the difference between that and the NSA is that they have been built on the concept that they don't exist. Um, so their ability to come back and attack, especially right at the beginning when they did not know that this was about to happen, is, is far smaller than the Pentagon's abilities. And the State Department, I mean, interestingly enough, the WikiLeaks Persons at Risk Group, the 24-7, that was specifically set up to deal with media because Clinton was about to go on a worldwide tour. Um, and the task force, don't forget, WTF. 
Right, that was the CIA, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But specifically, the State Department had known for six months that uh, Manning had likely disclosed diplomatic cables, and they knew which database it was from. And so it was interesting, you know, as uh, you know, the um, releases started to begin, um, that they feigned sort of a complete surprise. Uh, they had already done, you know, the chief submissions from all the embassies around the world had already done a review and contacted their counterparts and the like. So they, they were totally prepped for that. Um, I wanted to know if, if we are capable of doing a Q&A at some point and if there's any questions from the audience. Is that possible? Is there anybody out there? <laughs> <laughs> anybody that works here know if we can do a Q&A? Um, Does anybody work here? <laughs> <laughs> this, this lady over here has a question. I can repeat your question if you want to just... So the what, question is, is what is Edward Snowden going to do when his temporary asylum runs out? Um, what exactly he's actually going to do is obviously um, uh, up to his uh, legal team. He has several options um, in that he can reapply in Russia for the same temporary asylum, um, which is a, um, a, a, an asylum that lasts a year. It's different from the sort of... Um, a political asylum that, that they have, which other countries have, which then is more a, a lifetime status. Um, obviously, he could also try and apply in other countries. Um, I, my personal opinion is from uh, sa very sadly how uh, we seem to, how things seem to be displayed in other countries. Um, for example, Germany is that the governments are not feeling strong enough to actually stand up for him. So. You've got two months to sort your government out, people. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? You know, something that I wanted to talk to you about was um, when, when you first arrived, Der Spiegel had done a piece. <laughs> um, you know that the media partners here. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> um, yeah, go on. Which, was, which to me was a bit pejorative to some degree. Um, you know, having spoken to you, um, I have respect for you as uh, in the work that you've done. Um, I think it's been really courageous and um, and rigorous. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> So I, I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, that particular article? Or, the or just in general about, you know, your role and your... I think it's a difficult thing because by the nature of the sort of um, the attacks that we get and therefore the security that we need, we tended to have not, with the vast majority of staff, sort of, we don't... Um, say exactly what they do because it's then easy to um, become a target. Um, if our entire organization was able to be mapped out of exactly who did what, it would then be very easy for um, the CIA, whoever, to, to, to start targeted attacks. Um, uh, Julian made a very conscious decision after uh, pressure uh, from the, the media um, to put a face to the organization after some, some time when we didn't have one. To, to go out there and say, yes, I head up this organization and became a complete lightning rod so that the rest of us could, could have a level of protection. So I suppose with that sort of background, as people started to become known, um, then um, it, it's maybe difficult for, for media to understand um, who we are. I have found an interesting um, experience, though, in that I have worked with a lot of our media organizations they know what I do because they work with me um, on certain publications. So they know when I've done um, X, Y, or Z. Um, so it's, I found it um, very sad when those journalists that I have worked with um, call me a companion of Snowden or a um, 
Yeah, cleaner is the other one. And a, I've all, oh, I organized a party, apparently, <laughs> according to someone <laughs> once. Um, so it's, it's interesting, I suppose, why they do this. Um, I think it's an easy way to try to legitimize, delegitimize the organization if you can play down everyone's roles. Oh, it's just Julian and then some cleaners and party people. Um, rather than an actual uh, legitimate publishing organization that's, I'm biased, but I would say doing a better job than most of them. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon on why, why they can't do this. You know, I'd like for you to talk to me about the value of archives. You talked a little bit about it. The, you know, WikiLeaks has various uh, types of documents. Um, certainly, they have documents other than just simply Manning's releases as well. So, uh, you know, one of the um, projects that I really like quite well is, is Plus D, is the Public Library of U.S. Diplomacy. Um, can, we, can we talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the fact that WikiLeaks sort of doesn't just publish censored material, that they also publish material that is hard to access? Yeah, it's, from the beginning, our mission has been to publish um, classified or in any other way censored um, information that is of uh, political, uh, historical um, importance. And we have always felt this, um, uh, the concept of having archives and full, full sets of information. And also with archives, it's, it's about um, having those collections made usable and being able to create relationships between different sets of documents. Um, if you have a whole archive of cables, um, plus D that you mentioned, for example, is yes, it's um, a compendium of leaked cables, but also declassified cables. Um, and it is now the largest collection of United States diplomatic cables um, online in the world. It's at over two million. And by searching it and using it, you can actually see the relationship um, far better um, to, to analyze uh, this, these sorts of documents than you can if you just read one cable and then it's, Go back. it's interesting yeah. because, I mean, in, in, in my discussions with other journalists uh, at other organizations, like, for example, the Washington Post, they use, uh, you know, Plus D and WikiLeaks every single day in their work. Yeah, and you can see stories come out that link to it on the internet every single day. So it's, it's of um, ongoing historical importance. Um, yes, we have a question here. Where? Right, up, right in front. Oh. <laughs> I've got my glasses on. <laughs> Take your time, Danny. <laughs> if you ask it, I'll repeat it. Just talk amongst yourselves. Hi, Diani Beretta from Wow Holland Foundation and the Free Chelsea Manning Network. Um, it's grand to see you on stage. Uh, it's really an amazing thing. Um, as we're approaching the year anniversary of the Snowden uh, re revelations, um, we've had an absurd turn. We have an absurd turn of events happening in Germany because now we have U.S. legal firms writing legal opinions for the German government, threatening parliamentarians and not wanting to acknowledge their immunity were they to travel to the U.S. So. Now parliamentarians are also in a very um, difficult situation. Um, you said we have two months to uh, rally for the government here. I wanted to ask you, what can we, because I'd like to take advantage that we're here in Republica, we have well, viewers worldwide and in Germany, what can we actually do right now? Do you think it's maybe wise to petition to the European uh, High Court for Human Rights or any other uh, campaigns that we could start now? I think people are a little bit at a loss. They don't know what else to do because there's political inertia in their own government. Thank you. Um, yeah, the legal uh, advice that you're referring to was very interesting um, because um, it, the situation to do with the, the inquiry is that um, the um, 
minority are able to call for Snowden to be a witness, which I think basically the government sort of had to, felt it, well, it had to go along with for a bit. And you can see these sorts of tricks now coming into play where they're, they're trying to find reasons why they can't actually let this happen. Um, so I think it's very important to keep the pressure on um, here in Germany so that uh, the minority is, is able to succeed. Um, I think also that it is important that um, other countries in Europe um, stand with Germany and say that they won't let the US um, have dominance over Germany and that they will support Germany um, when, if, if it were to, to offer Snowden asylum. So although it's become um, quite big within the German um, uh, political sphere, quite a big topic. I think it's also very important when you're looking at something like this that other, other nations, so I know there's quite a lot of people f here from the international audience, um, if people can go and get their politicians to, to stand in solidarity with Germany and show that there is support, that Germany won't just have to stand alone against the US, I think that that's a way in which hopefully um, uh, someone can stand up against the United States government. Sarah, a question about the world where you want to live. Can is you, it, sorry, can you speak up? I can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I want to ask about the world where you want to live. Is it a world where every data is free? Like free information for everyone? Or is it a world where privacy is respected? And do you think it's possible? Or do you think with the amount of technical data around us exploding, it is not possible in the end? Um, I think that there's a problem with a lot of the amount of data that has been collected in certain ways so far, in that actually it is information that is private information. Um, and there's some backtracking to do if we're to actually write that, um, which is a very difficult thing to do to try to say, I don't know if you saw, there was a document that came out um, from the NSA revelations that was um, from their intranet, which was um, a guy talking about how they can attack, uh, sys they should attack system admins, because this is then sort of a, a keyhole to get into a full system. Um, and what was very interesting to me was the, the way you saw the psyche of, of many people working at the, this agency. Um, and it was, let's collect it all, let's get it all. I know we've got too much, but it's just so great. Um, and this is sort of very disturbing to me that we now have a situation where all of our personal information has been taken and collected in one place. Um, and to backtrack from that, to get these agencies, to get the psyche of these people to actually change is a, is a very tough uphill battle. Um, the first, the point that you're, the question you're actually asking though, I think that there is, um, uh, um, I, I believe in the privacy of um, individuals like us, where I think there should be complete transparency. It is of um, powerful people that um, have a, a dominance um, or ability to dominate over us. And that's where I think that, that um, there should be full transparency. And then when it comes to our history and creating our historical archive, um, being in the public record, that's another area of information which I think should be fully published. Um, personal data of, of individuals such as ourselves, um, I think should be kept private. Um, and I hope this balance, the problem we now have is this balance is completely off kilter. We have governments keeping everything private and they're collecting all of our personal information and rectifying this balance, changing it. <laughs> it it's a huge uphill battle and, and hopefully we can achieve it. One of the things that's not oftentimes brought into this conversation as well is the fact that, for example, 70% of the U.S. intelligence budget is from private contractors. Yep. Contractors make up 50% or more of the CIA. You know, um, so there's also the uh, fact that this is also in partnership with corporations, and the corporations will blame the government, and the government will blame the corporations. So, and the corporations don't have the same supposed um, uh, uh, liability liability that, 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 that governments have. 
it's a huge beast now. It's, it's billions of dollars are thrown at this. Billions and billions of dollars are thrown at this industry. Um, as you say, the lines are now blurred between governments and corporations. Um, Snowden worked for a number of corporations um, and had access to all this same information. Um, so it's it's a very it's very complex in how you actually start trying to control it. I personally would say that um, the only way to do it is to start to do things like a budget, a huge budget cut. Um, you really need to completely minimize the abilities of these agencies or it's impossible to stop. It will just keep growing. You know, I think also about the idea of oversight within the U.S. Congress. Um, when you see the, the fact that, well, for example, most covert activity in the U.S. is already approved by the intelligence committees. Um, and the relationship between, uh, you know, former directors of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the CIA, they oftentimes work for uh, these contractors that eventually develop these relationships with the government. In fact, in the U.S., what's interesting is it's not just simply the U.S. government going to AT&T or telecommunications firms and talking about, uh, we need this from you. There is this uh, push, uh, you know, since 9-11 for that public-private partnership where uh, the most of the uh, infrastructure in the U.S. is owned by private corporations. So DH, uh, sorry, the Department of Homeland Security and the intelligence community have actually uh, created an even deeper relationship between the two where you have companies coming up with technology that they will sell to the government to, uh, for you know, disaster preparedness or some kind of ideological uh, reason um, that really solidifies their power. There is very little check against that. I think, yeah, there's, there's, it's difficult to check. And also this essentially corporatization of the whole industry means that um, the actual reasons behind it become very different. When you have so many corporations involved, they obviously have a very different um, uh, reason to do something than our government supposedly does, our government's meant to be protecting us, and you can see it, for example, in the NSA revelations where they say, oh, but we need these things to um, stop terrorist attacks. But it is quite clear that they haven't, and it, is, it has been shown through these documents that these, these methods are not actually protecting us at all. It is about um, giving power, and when you're then blurring it with corporations, the ability to check this becomes... Um, almost impossible. There's also needs to sort of, you know, be a kind of cost-benefit analysis about this. You know, is, uh, you know, what, what is the greater harm? I mean, if you're going to go for the idea of a balancing test between national security, so to speak, or, or unity and personal freedom, um, or, you know, one's inalienable rights, um, it certainly is questionable because even the, the, the organs that are in the United States, for example, that are meant to uh, have deliberation over these important issues um, really don't have deliberation. I mean, oftentimes, uh, personally, I sometimes I'm a little confused about what's going on with the Snowden documents, and this is my own opinion, um, because I feel like if, if Congress was capable of oversight, then wouldn't it seem that Snowden would have protected communications with a member of Congress? Yeah, and it's something that the U.S. government has tried to push to attack Snowden. It's that, that there are certain um, uh, methods in place for a whistleblower in this industry to speak out. Um, but they're, they're completely twisting it there. I mean, he was working for a contractor um, at that time, and these protections don't exist um, for for contractors. Um, he should be able to, as you say, go and speak to a member of Congress, but I, having seen what happened to people such as um, Thomas Drake, these protections that the government now is loving to sort of spin out uh, are just not actually there in reality and people's lives are devastated by it. Thomas Drake tried to use some of those channels and it, they just don't work. Does anybody else have any questions? Excuse okay. me, I just, I just wanted to ask you all the time, um, how are you doing and how do you get along in Where Berlin? Where are you? I'm here. Oh. Um, I'm just, I just wanted to ask you how you're doing and how you get along in Berlin, maybe just a few words. Um, 
would be very how I like to Berlin. Know that. Yeah, and how are you doing? Berlin's a great city. Um, no, I like Berlin a lot. Um, it's been I've been very lucky in coming here in that. Um, there's a great community of people, uh, many of whom I knew before coming here. Um, the Wow Holland Foundation, um, that um, is a great organization that uh, has helped us beat the banking blockade and collects money for us. For example, um, many members of their board are here. Um, friends of mine like Jake Applebaum that um, unfortunately are able, unable to go to the United States um, have also been residing here. So I was very lucky in that um, when I came, there was already a community here that could help. And it's just grown, so thank you. We have a question over here. Just a few days ago, uh, the Council of Europe has uh, published an expertise on whistleblower protection in Europe, which is actually not very good. Here in Germany, for example, uh, whistleblower protection is only indirect via the journalistic sources, but there is no law which actually protects informants. So what should future Edward Snowdens do? Uh, come to us. <laughs> um, <coughs> I think it's an interesting thing with the concept of, of whistleblower laws. My feeling is that um, there are pushes within... Um, uh, nations to try and strengthen their, their laws. I think that actually the reality, the real politic of the situation is that if you get someone like an Edward Snowden, they're not actually going to be able to have in real terms um, the protections that they need within their country. They're just battling uh, too, too large an opposition. Um, I think that actually is what is needed internationally is something a bit more like the Refugee Convention or an international treaty where if there's a whistleblower from one country, there is an obligation from other countries to take them. I think that that's a much more realistic solution. I think that's about all we have time for, I'm afraid. Okay. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you.